Wake that ass up early in the morning. The Breakfast Club. Yes, it's the world's most dangerous morning show, The Breakfast Club. Charlemagne the God, Angela Yee, DJ Envy is off, and we have a man who is running to be mayor of New York. Uh, he, from what I was told, he was raised. He was. You born in New York, right? No, I was. I was actually born in uh, in Orlando, Florida, and I stayed there two months after I was born. My father was stationed uh, overseas after that. Well, this, this is Isaac Wright Jr. But at some point, you ended up in Monk's Corner. Indeed. Okay, that's my hometown. <laughs> and it was my hometown. I call it my hometown. That's my ancestral how long, town. How long did you live there? Uh, when we moved from Germany, um, it was probably 19. 1973, 74. Mm -hmm. And um, I spent some of my middle school, obviously finished high school. So you went to Berkeley? Berkeley High School, yeah. Wow. Yeah, I played with the Stags. Wow. Track. Okay. I was, uh, you know, I was um, a high school uh, champion in the 400 meter mm -hmm. in Berkeley. And then, um, you know, young adult, I uh, moved to New York. I moved to New York uh, around 18, 18 years old, 18, 19 years old. Okay. And uh, I've been in New York ever since. So, so it's 80 since 1980. I've been in New York. And so, how did how did 50 Cent, you know, find out about your life story to want to do a whole TV show about it for life on it? Well, it used to be on ABC for a couple seasons. Yeah, yeah. Going somewhere else now, but yeah, um, yeah. It's actually it's actually uh, I I can't talk about it, but it's you know we're we have a we have another network that's oh, already. Already, yeah. We oh, wow. Have somebody, so. Okay, shout out to stars. Yeah, <laughs> no, it's not stars. It's not stars. <laughs> <laughs> well, how did that uh, happen? I mean, it's, um, you know, there was a guy, uh, I should say was, I mean, he's he, he's still alive, but he's a close friend of mine now. Uh, I didn't know him at the time. His name is Hove. Uh, he ran uh, a fight club, an illegal fight club in the Bronx mm -hmm. called the BX Fight Club. And uh, he was very successful. He, um, you know, he's getting three, 400 people you know, at his shows, and you know, rappers would come out and and uh, and uh, perform an intermission. Fat Joe, Remy Ma, uh, he was trying to get Fifty out. Fifty and him are friends, uh, but Fifty wouldn't go out to perform because uh, Fifty had a promotional license at the time, and uh, he didn't want to get filmed at an illegal fight club and lose his license. Wow! So he was like, "Listen, you you got to get legal. If you don't get legal, I, I can't I can't come out there." So he tried. You know, he went through a number of attorneys and. Uh, uh, he spent a lot of money, and you know everyone told him it was impossible. I think Fifty, you know, threw him a couple of attorneys, and they told him the same thing it was impossible. So, Darren Dean, you know, the owner of Rough Riders, mm -hmm. is a friend of mine. He um, he uh, he was kind of complaining to Darren, and Darren said, "Listen, man, while these guys fail, I I think I I got somebody that might be able to help you." So, he introduced the both of us, and you know, Hove told me a story, and uh, I agreed to help him, and I I got him legal in two weeks. Fifty wow. came out and performed. He told, you know, 50 was like, you know, how how the hell did you do this? I mean, how how did you get legal like this? And he told 50 that, I, you know, how I helped him and told him my story. 50 set up a meeting and the rest was history. Wow. So can we talk about your life story just in case people who are <laughs> listening might not know about it, but let's talk about how you ended up incarcerated for yeah. a crime you didn't commit. Yeah. Um, you know, before I, 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 this happened in New Jersey. And I was living in New York at the time, and you know, I got, I was married young, had a had a had a daughter, Tequila, and Tiki, yeah, Tiki, yeah, <laughs> and, went to school uh, with Tiki, yes. And so, you know, Tiki was a, Tiki was probably, probably at this time maybe like five or six years old, and, um, you know, I was doing well. I mean, we struggled. You know, when Tiki was born, we struggled for a while, and you know, the break that I had uh, was on Star Search. I got on Star Search. I was on Star Search for a few weeks, and you know, during this time, inf in, uh, hip hop was in its infancy. So I parlayed that, you know, into a pretty successful career. Even Tiki's mom, you know, she was a member of the Cover Girls. They sold millions of records, so we were doing really well. And we decided um, that we were going to move to New Jersey. You know, back then, you know, people with money in the industry they either moved to Westchester or they moved over to New Jersey. So we moved over to New Jersey, and within nine months of me being in in New Jersey. You know, I was in jail facing the rest of my life in prison. Yikes. You know, and, uh, you know, I, I moved into a situation where there was a, a prosecutor at the time uh, who was running, uh, for lack of a better word, a criminal enterprise out of the prosecutor's office. The detectives was involved. And, you know, there was just so many things that, that they were doing that was happening before I even moved to New Jersey. Mm -hmm. So when I moved to New Jersey, I moved into that situation uh, in the sense that uh, during, you know, during... Uh, these investigations that this prosecutor was was having, 
um, uh, through another individual, I came under his radar. I, I wasn't even in his jurisdiction, but they were set up to uh, arrest people. Uh, a lot of them set them up, uh, extort them for assets and wealth um, in exchange for different types of deals. They would even take property and uh, have their friends after they take it through the forfeiture, they would have their friends go to the auctions, you know, and then purchase the property through the auctions. I mean, mm -hmm. it was it was a it was an entire scheme that uh, he was running uh, in the office, and so I got caught up into that. And uh, when I was arrested, they tried to extort me for half a million dollars, uh, and they wanted the me, police. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. They 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 got me in a room, and was you know like give up the money. We you know we know you have it. We want the money. Uh, and um, which was not true. And they wanted me, because at the time, you know, I, I knew a lot of people, both in the street. I mean, when I came to New York, I lived in 145th at Edgecombe in the 80s. I went there to Far Rockaway Projects. I mean, I was, I was literally in the shit, you know, for lack of a better word. And so as I moved up, um, you know, I, I did not disassociate myself with, with you know, with, with people that I considered were my friends. Uh, so they wanted me to do a, a lot of things that, you know, it, that just wasn't who I was. Right, so, and, and I, and I, basically. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They wanted me to, to, to work for them. They wanted mm -hmm. me to go out and set people up, get them arrested. And so I, I refused. And I didn't refuse for the right or wrong of it. I, I refused to do it because I couldn't. The, the pain that I was going through and the, the destruction of my family, the things that I was seeing all around me, what was happening to me based on what, what they were doing, I could not give that pain to another individual. Word. That was my burden to carry. Wow. Wow. And so I, I wasn't gonna do it. I just I just could not see myself doing something like that. And I refused and, and and then they made it so they made an example out of me. You know, they okay, you you're gonna buck us, we're gonna show you what we do to people and we wanna show the world what we do to people that tell us no, that has the audacity to fight. And so, you know, I, I wound up with a with a life sentence, plus seventy years in prison. Damn. And so how did you end up sitting with us right now? For, for those who haven't watched for life. <laughs> you know, it was been a long road, uh, Charlemagne. It's been a it's been a real long road, man. I um I went through the seven and a half years before I, I got exonerated. I did another seven seven years uh in 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 uh in in college. And and this is the difference with for life. Aaron Wallace in for life got his law degree in prison. You know, and this is something that's very important for for people to understand the distinctions. He got his law degree in prison, and, and that's a unique situation because what that means is, is that when he's representing all these guys, he's representing them as an attorney, as a skilled, learned, educated attorney. You know, I got 20 people out of prison, over 20 people out of prison while I was there. A lot of them had life sentences, and I got my own self out by getting a police officer to confess on the stand seven years later. That's how good I got. And I only had a high school diploma. Wow. I did it with a high school diploma. That was the reality of it. I did this with a high school diploma. I got out seven and a half years later after the police officer confessed, and I spent the next seven years in law school. So the, the true story is that <clears throat> it was seven and a half years in prison, seven years pursuing a law degree. Um, I graduated from law school on time, mm -hmm. and then I'm and I'm exonerated, record clean. If I get pulled over today and a, and a cop pulls my record, is there's absolutely nothing there, not even a speeding ticket. But still, after being exonerated, passing your bar, going through all this, the Committee on Character, which is supposed to take a few, a few weeks, the Committee on Character investigated me for nine more years before giving me a license. You know? Wow. So you, you add it up. You got seven years, seven, seven and a half years in prison, mm -hmm. seven years pursuing a law degree, mm -hmm. nine more years you know, being investigated for no reason, mm -hmm. you know, just to get a license. That's 23 so, years. This is a quarter of your life. Quarter of my life, you know. And so, so when you look at the story of Aaron Wallace, uh, that's in, it's inspired by my life. My my reality was much much more darker than that, uh, and so and so this road to the mayor's office was a natural progression for me in in terms of my background, in terms of what I've gone through, the things that I've achieved, that ultimately put me in this race and got me here right now on the Breakfast Club. So that that's that's why you're running for mayor to, to help people that have been in situations like you. I'm I'm running for mayor to to help to fight for people that can't fight for themselves and 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 you know not only that New York is in a unique situation right now post COVID. Uh, there's things going on with New York that has never happened before. For example, 
I've never seen Times Square empty in my life. When mm -hmm. COVID first uh, started, I've seen, Times Square was empty uh, for almost a year. I mean, completely empty. Uh, uh, high rises, floors, one floor after the other, completely empty. Mm -hmm. A half a million people lost their jobs. <clears throat> New York as a city cannot borrow money. So the tax base has decreased, um, which increased the gap, <clears throat> excuse me, in the budget. So how, did, how does New York get money? How do, they, how do they rebound from that when they can't borrow money? They have to depend on the federal government and the state government for money. Uh, what that, what that was, it was clear to me at that point is that there needs to be someone, a, a special person. It's going to take a special person to get New York out of the bind that it's in. And if you look at this natural progression that I was talking about, you know, I, I literally, I made the impossible possible. I, I, I got into a system that I knew nothing about, and I learned it better than the people that was running it for decades. Mm -hmm. um, and in and, and, and learning it, I turned it against this, itself to right the wrong that was done, not only to myself, but to other people. And so when you look at the things that I achieved alone against an entire system, against an, the, the, the entire political establishment, you know, as mayor, I'm gonna have 300,000 employees. So if I could do what I did alone, what do you think I could do for New York with 300,000 employees? That's right. You know? well, what do you think the biggest issue is facing New York? <clears throat> I think there's three major issues facing New York. One is housing. Uh, obviously, the other is the economy. Uh, and the third is criminal justice reform. Mm. Well, not, I mean, those, not, those issues are across the board. Yeah. Yeah. But they're, they're very, very, especially housing and, and criminal justice reform, they're very, very significant uh, in New York and in most of the pollings, um, you know, homelessness and housing is number one. Uh, and when you and there's and there's a number of reasons, not just not just related to COVID. You know, you you have the issues of of these uh, evictions and foreclosures that are coming, and 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 the guys that are running, they don't have answers for that. They're not mm -hmm. they're not they don't have answers to what's going to happen when when all of these people who these thousands and thousands of people who hadn't paid rent for over a year, mm -hmm. uh, who haven't paid mortgage for over a year. They're going to wind up in the street because, you know, the courts are going to come calling and they're going to have to answer to that. <clears throat> the other issue is, is New York City Housing Authority. New York City Housing Authority re houses over a half a million people. And decade after decade after decade, uh, these people are born uh, and they die with, without ever owning anything. And that's not why New York City Housing Authority was set up. They're serial landlords. What needs to happen and what I would do first first day in office is convert New York City Housing Authority from a serial landlord to a conduit for home ownership so that every single person that's living in these complexes will have the option to own their units. They can they can leverage those units to send their kids to college. They can leave something behind when they're gone. You know, they can use it to start a better life, but at least they have a foundation for wealth that the average American is supposed to have in general. That's something for decades that hasn't happened. Mayor after mayor has let New York City down in that respect, and that's something that I'm going to change from day one. Mm. What are your thoughts about the current mayor right now, Bill de Blasio? I mean, I mean, he's the mayor, uh, you know. And I, one of the, one of the things that uh, about about past uh, leaders <clears throat> is that, you know, the worst and the best. There's, there's not a lot that you need to say about a leader that's horrible because the people feel it. You know, the, the, the thing about, the thing about re, uh, leading a city, and especially a city like New York, is when you go into uh, a, a position like mayor, the purpose of going into that position is to change the quality of the lives of the people that live in that city. And if the, people's, if the quality of these people's lives have not changed, you know, that, that mayor is not going to be there for long. And if, he's, and if he remains there, that's because their choices have not been better than what they have. Mm. And that's been the, the, the issue with New York, uh, election after election after election, is that they have not had those choices. And money is a, is a, the corruption of money is one of the reasons why, you know, they don't have those choices. Uh, even me in my, in my race. You know, you don't, you don't see me, you know, you didn't see me sitting in the debates. You didn't, you didn't see me sitting there, even though I'm the best candidate. Uh, by far, I'm, I'm the best candidate. And, and I'm saying that understanding that they're, they're candidates who are career politicians, who's been in, in politics for, for a long time. Um, but, the, but the people <clears throat> were not given a chance uh, uh, to have that choice the way they should have. And, and, and this, is, this is important because the reason why I'm on the ballot right now is because the people chose me to be on the ballot. 
This race started out with 40 candidates. And in order to get on the ballot, New York City residents, voters, have to choose you to be on the ballot. Mm. Once you get on the ballot, what the Campaign Finance Board does is they create they create this measuring stick based on money. You have to raise a certain amount of money, mm-hmm. and you actually have to spend a certain amount of money in order to be under the debates. So what does that mean? That means that they have the, the ability through money to pick and choose who they want to put before the public, even though the public chose these people to run. Wow. You know, and so people don't know that, that the residents of New York do not know that that's what they're doing. Uh, and and it, it's a corrupt system. And when you look at it, and, and, I, and I say this wholeheartedly, every single person, every single Democrat that was on those debates should have spoken up about that type of tragedy. They should have spoken up. But the reason why they didn't, because they're a part of the problem. They're not in that office. And, and I want you, you know, this is something to really think about. When you have a candidate raising eight, nine, ten million dollars in during COVID, these people don't have any money out here. He's raising eight, nine, ten million dollars during COVID. There's something wrong with that. You already know that this person has been leveraged so high mm. that the moment he gets in office, he's gonna be busy paying back debts instead of keeping his promises to the people. And this is what's been happening in New York City, election after election after election. You know, so if you had the opportunity to get a donation, like a sizable donation, you would feel like it's not a positive thing because then you would owe a debt? I have a, I have a, is, if that donation does not come from the average New Yorker, and when it comes from the average New Yorker, it's gonna be $10 here, $15 here, $20 here. Uh, if it does not come, if it's not a deal, that's made directly with the people, not with the unions, Mm -hmm. not with major corporations, but a deal that's made directly with the people where all you do is provide them a website and on their own, they go and they give you what they can afford. If it's not that, I'm not taking the money because I'm not gonna be in nobody's office. I'd rather not be in in office if, if, if I'm leveraged to the point where I cannot help the people of New York. Every, every policy that I have, every agenda that I have is designed to increase the quality of people's lives, not to enrich big business. And so, and so I, I cannot take their money. I'll use my money and I'll use a, the small donations that I get you know, through that donate button that's on my website you know, and, and that's on some of my social media. I've heard a lot of politicians say that. Um, a- AOC said that. AOC said she would never take you know, any money from a big corporation or a business. Um, but then you know, somebody like Secretary Pete, I remember he said once, I'll take some. I'll take the corporate money as long as they know I'm not beholden to them. If they're giving me the money because they really believe in my campaign and they really believe what you know I'm going to do, I'll I'll take it. But I'm not taking it with them saying, "Hey, you owe us one." Yeah, but 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 that's a double reverse, mm-hmm. <laughs> you know. And he knows that. That's a double reverse. You big business. Why are they giving you money? These are people that are in business for profit. Like if if you give me as a, if you give me a, a money as a citizen, there's a reason why you're giving me money, because you're hoping that I'm gonna do something for you and your community. That's why you're giving me money. Mm-hmm. You're you're giving me money because you're making a deal with me. That citizen is making a deal with me mm-hmm. that I'm going to get in office and I'm going to do the things that I promise for them that I'm doing. So why is big business giving me money? What if they what, this, what if what if they giving it to you because they just feel like you're the person that could really change things? For who? Right. For them? But just in general, maybe I mean, I'm just saying I'm just I'm, not, I'm just playing <laughs> no, I understand. devil's advocate here. I understand, but 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 this is not you, you know big business is beholding to their shareholders. Mm-hmm. There's a difference between big and they have to answer for that money that they give you. They can't just give you money and not answer for it. There's a mm-hmm. reason behind them giving you money. If they want to do some humanitarian efforts, that they could do that to the community themselves. themselves they don't need to yeah. give it to me. You know, there's a reason why big business gives money, and anybody can come in here and make any kind of excuse that they want to make. Mm-hmm. Th- that doesn't change the reality. Big business is in business to make money. They are beholding to their shareholders, and every dime they're spent is accountable, and they have to answer for it. Why are you giving this man this money? Word, word. Period. If, if you become mayor, what are some policies from uh, de Blasio that you, would, that you would keep, that you would continue? One of the things that de Blasio did do is de Blasio gave money to these grassroots organizations that's in the community, 
uh, and that's and that's and that's that's dealing with crime prevention, mm-hmm. and, and that's very very that's a very very important subject because that deals directly with criminal justice reform. You know, law enforcement officers are are just what they are. They enforce the law, and we have to really look at them for what they are. We cannot depend on them to do the things that we're responsible for doing. Mm-hmm. When it comes down to crime prevention, crime prevention is the responsibility of the community, and and, and Bill De Blasio did give money to these grassroots organizations that's out there in the community. Uh, that's that's uh, dealing with issues, conflicts that ultimately can turn into crimes and resolving them. And I'll give you an example of that. When you have violence in the community, and violence is on the rise, when you have violence in the community, it usually starts with a conflict that the community already knows about. All right? Violence does not occur in communities where there's no conflict that, that occurs before that. The community knows about it. The community is in the best position to resolve and dissolve issues that could potentially turn into conflicts, especially violent conflicts, than anybody else, especially law enforcement. When law enforcement gets on the scene, the crime is already committed. And so and so one of the biggest things in criminal justice reform is to is to have the the, the full power of the mayor's office and the full financial support of the mayor's office with these grassroots organizations in these communities for purposes of crime prevention. And I can guarantee you that the crime rate would go down exponentially with that kind of support from the mayor's office. And that's one of the things that I'm doing, you know, when I become mayor. What, what, what do you think about that NYPD and how do you think the NYPD needs to be changed? You know, we've been having this whole big topic about defunding the police and moving some of that those funds and allocating them for different resources. What do you think about the NYPD? Well, you know, one of the things that I that I that I understand about issues uh, and, and trying to resolve issues is is to to identify the, the issue's source, you know. And, and the NYPD uh, is is not our real problem in terms of making change. It is the police union. The unions are the, are the, are the uh, have the power. I mean, uh, uh, De Blasio would get on 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 the air and and he'd and he'd you know get down on the on the police about certain types of issues with brutality and in the next day 5,000 officers doesn't show up for work mm. you know that's a union issue and the unions has been bullying the mayor's office for a very very long time and so that's one issue that has to be resolved and there's ways to resolve that issue I mean one of the things that's important for me to say is that the one of the reasons why I'm here today is because I understood law enforcement I I, I dealt with them so intimately in my fight against what happened to me that I was able to get a law enforcement officer. And this wasn't just an average law enforcement officer. When I got arrested, this man was working as a detective in the prosecutor's office. When I got him back on the stand seven and a half years later, he was a chief of, a, of the police academy. All right. I got him to confess on the stand under oath, you know, and because I understood that be, beneath all that corruption, he was still a human being. And, and that's we, what I'd be wondering about. I always wonder where's the just human empathy in these people sometimes. It, it's there, but from one person to another, it's buried. And, and, and the depth of how it's buried, it differs from one, from one person to another. But when you're talking about a culture, uh, uh, you attack that from the top. You don't attack cultures from the ground. You attack cultures from the top because, because that's where it's massaged. And that's where it's, it's it's financed from the top. Mm. That's where you deal with the police unions. And and let me let me say this because because one of the things about unions uh, that moves unions is money. You know, one of the major forces that moves a union uh, and that that changes their insight on things that they need to do and how they want to fight against against a pushback is money. And so let's look at it like this, especially when it comes to defunding the police. In, in its literal terms, I don't agree with defunding the police in its literal terms, and I know that that's not what it really means. I know that, that politicians on, on different sides of the fence try to use that uh, as a sword and shield against what the essence of defunding the police really means. Defunding the police really means diverting money to, to resources uh, that's going to change the culture of, of brutality, change the culture of silence, you know, and change the culture of corruption. That, that the average citizen has been experiencing for decades in New York City. And so one of the things about doing that and one of the ways that you make change is not just diverting the money. I don't, I don't believe in taking anything from the police if I want change. If I want change, I believe in forcing the police to share. So, so let me give you an example of what I mean when I say that. And this, is, and this, is, this, is, this comes down to how the, the way in which uh, you effectuate change. Uh, the, the way in which you see change and the way in which you effectuate it. If I had a million dollars 
and I divvied up that million to each one of you all here individually, you all are going to go your separate ways. I'm not bringing you all together by divvying up the money. Mm -hmm. However, if I take that money and if I say to you, this money is in one pot, you all have to share it. You all are going to then work together. All right. And so the issue is not taking the money from the police. The issue is keeping the money there. If the police has $10 billion, take a billion and says, listen, I want you. I'm not going to take this billion from you. I want you to write a billion dollar check to these grassroots organizations. I want you to give it to them. I am demanding and requiring you to write that check directly to these organizations. Why am I doing that? Because I'm forcing them to work together. I am I am forcing, forcing the police and the grassroots organizations to work, work together. together to, I'm, I am forcing them to invest in the change in our communities. And, and, and in that way, ultimately, you know, everybody wants to, to have a say in the good things that happens in our communities. Everybody wants to participate and take part in the positive changes that occurs in our community. And to force them to share that money is to force them to work together and ultimately to force them to partake in the good things, the good results, the lowering of the crime rate that occurs because they ultimately were forced to work together. And through time, that chasm, that chasm, that gap between what law enforcement sees in themselves and what the community sees in law enforcement will change. That culture of silence, that culture of brutality, you know, is chiseled away. And that's just one aspect of, of getting the job done. There's a number of other different ways that, that you can also implement change uh, uh, together with, with that what, same issue. What would be the incentive for the police to do that, though? There is there there is no and that and that's and that's you know understand understand what I'm saying. There is no incentive for the police on their own to give anybody anything. Mm -hmm. What I'm saying is is that and, and you got to remember who the mayor is. The mayor is the top cop. You know, no matter how you want to look at it, the mayor is the top cop. When the mayor says you're going to give them this money, you're going to give them that money. You know, and so the the issue becomes the issue becomes, you know, forcing change, and and ultimately, you get with the program. You, the money's gone anyway. So it's either you get with the program or the money's going to go anyway and you're going to get left behind. Yeah, I just, I just wonder how is that going to slow down like things like police brutality? Like what would be the incentive for not only officers to give the money to the grassroots organizations, but also for officers to go out there and do what's right by the people in those communities? Police, bru pr police brutality is, is, is an individual issue, one police uh, to the other. And, and that's, a, that's, no. an, that's an accountability issue. You don't think it's, it's a system? It, no, okay. When you say it's a system, you have to you have to first uh, uh, understand where it comes from. Because you said it starts at the top. No, I, I said it's massaged from the top. Okay, but it's but but brutality starts at the ground level. It is it is massaged no. and it is absolutely. Uh, the the police unions have never has never brutal, br brutalized an individual. Yeah, but the police unions protect those people on the ground, and the people on the ground know that the people at the top gonna have their back, so they have no reason well, to. And there's no yeah, there's no, no accountability. You you gotta when it understand. Comes to cops. You, I agree with you, but you gotta understand the essence of brutality. You, you gotta understand it, and I'm saying this I'm saying this based on a victim. When it comes down to brutality, brutality is an individualized decision. I don't care who you're br brutalizing. I can't do it if that's not me. I'm, it's, I'm never going to be able to incorporate that kind of personality to be able to brutalize someone. I don't care how many people around me is doing it. Mm -hmm. That's an individualized decision. What happens, what happens is that those people who are able to do that, who are built like that, those law enforcement officers who have these personality disorders, when they see that, that, that their actions are protected, it then evolves into a culture, but it starts individualized. It doesn't things that happen at the ground doesn't start at the top. The protection. But people like that shouldn't even be cops, don't you think? Absolutely. Because Absolutely. How are they even on the police force and how is that allowed and what type of training is happening to let them know that nothing's going to happen and then other police officers who don't speak up Absolutely. and cover. They all need to go. Mm -hmm. And also it, didn't it start as a culture though? Cuz I mean if you if you look at the origins of the police and you look at them as the original slave catchers, that mm -hmm. was always their job absolutely those were individualized decisions those were decisions by individuals let, let me explain to you why I'm I'm, I'm 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 focusing on the individualized aspect of what's happening because mm -hmm. because rooting out problems uh, really really takes a complex understanding of, of, of the reality of it let's talk about the system in this country you know because this is this is we're talking about systems here we have the greatest system in the world 
we we gotta we gotta understand what our problem is. Systems don't do anything to people. People do. It is the people that's running the system that's the problem. But they created the system. But but they created the system to work a specific kind of way for one person versus the other. Absolutely. Okay. But it's a person that made that decision. It's people. I'll give you an example. If a system works 100% for you, it also can work 100% for me. The reason why it doesn't is because someone chose, someone chose for it not to work for you. For not to work for me. And so, and so what we have to do in, in dealing with a system, we have to understand what the real problem is. The problem is people, man. The, the problem right now, me, and I'm going to give you an example of that. I'm sitting here talking to you right now, but I'm supposed to be in prison. It was a person that made a decision to change the wrong that another person did. It's the same system that let me out. The same system that put me in prison for the rest of my life for no reason, that same system let me out. But it, the difference was in the individuals that was making decisions. That made an incredible difference. And the problems, and this goes back to this election, the choices that the people make on who they choose to be leaders. Mm -hmm. We have to be extremely careful about that because we have a system that's incredible when it works properly. But it's never worked properly for everybody. And that's why I, 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 when the people say freedom, liberty, justice for all, that's always that's a farce. That's bullshit. Yeah, that's, like a, from that's, yeah, that's a farce. <laughs> yeah. But it, but it, but, but the it reason, could and it should. Absolutely. But the reason why it's a farce is because we have not, as a people, we have not instilled the kind of fear and insecurity in our leaders that we're supposed to. They have been able to pull the wool over our eyes and we've been following it. And I, I'll, I'll quote Einstein in, 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 that, in that respect. Einstein said that the definition of insanity Doing is trying the same, the same thing, thing over, and over and over again and expecting different results. Mm -hmm. All right, that's what New Yorkers have been doing over and over and over again. And, and, when, and, and when these people who are doing the wrong things see that they're able to do that consistently there's no job insecurity. Mm -hmm. Their jobs are secure. But the moment as a people we rise up and, 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 and provide them the proper type of job insecurity, they will do the right thing. What does job insecurity look like? Is that getting rid of qualified immunity? Absolutely. Job insecurity, that would cause a lot I, of job insecurity. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. and, and, and think about it. Some judge, this is the reason why we have qualified immunity. Either some judge or some legislature got together and found a way to protect people who are doing the wrong thing. And the excuse that they use is that they don't want these people to feel insecure about doing their job, right? Because they want them to be able to do their job the right way and, and, and not feel that they have to either let a person go or, you know, not arrest a person when, when, he, when that person they perceive has done wrong um, and not show other people that this is what's going to happen if you do the wrong thing. We, the only way that you can do the, your job correctly is to have that kind of job insecurity. But what it does, it breeds corruption mm. with impunity. Mm. That's what it actually does. They know that because they're not affected by it. So they're not going to change it. it. And this goes back to the people. True power is with the people. True power. I don't care how any type of regime, I don't care if you're a democracy, I do, I do not care if you're a dictatorship. Every single person that's in power gets their power from the people. And the moment the people rise up, the, the power structure changes. The reason why we're experiencing what we're experiencing here today in America and what we have been experiencing for decades and for centuries is because the people have refused to rise up in certain circumstances and the po p power that be has been successful in, for lack of a better word, dope feeding the people into realizing what's really <laughs> happening out there. Putting that choco. Yes. Word. Okay. I got a couple more questions. There's two more questions. What What the hell is this ranked choice voting thing? Well, what's the <laughs> point of it? Like, wh why? <laughs> Look, you know, even the experts haven't completely figured it out. Mm -hmm. um, but but the way it works is, you know, you know, ultimately what it means in in general sense is that the person who's number one may not necessarily be the one who actually wins at the end of the day. Wow. If, if, if that person doesn't have over 50% of the vote coming out of the box, um, they go through round after round after round, and then they start dealing with the number twos. The number twos move up. So 
a person that has more number twos can ultimately win the race. Mm -hmm. You know, after the third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth, ninth round. Um, and the reason behind that is, or, or the concept behind it, is that they want every single vote to be able to count, every vote. And this is the way they're choosing to do it. And it's, it's, kind, of be, it's kind of like a wave moving through the country because New York is not the first state to, to do that. Mm -hmm. uh, there's, there's other states that have been doing it, and, and more states are, are falling in line. How it's going to play itself out, I'm not sure. It's it just still, sounds complicated. It just feels so complicated. It is a little complicated. And when you look at the ballots, you know, there's, you have from one to five. And, you know, most people think to themselves, well, after I get past number one, what's what's the importance of number two, <laughs> three, four, five? And, and, and there's a reality to that. There is a reality because, you know, why why should the number my number three person be the winner? I don't even really like that person mm -hmm. that much. Um, but but what actually happens is is that number three person that you chose can ultimately carry some weight. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And who who's who's ultimately the mayor of New York City, and so on one end of it, it doesn't seem like like it carries any significance to a person, but on the other end, it could carry some weight down the line in one of the other rounds, the third, fourth, or fifth round of counting these votes. Got you. Yeah, I think it also eliminates runoff elections, and they say that those are really expensive to have yes. if yes. it's a close um, if it's a close vote. Yes. Then they don't have to have a runoff. Yes. Also. My, my, my final question, because there are some people who would say you don't have a chance of winning this race. So if you was talking to New Yorkers right now and talking to people like that, what would you tell them to, why they should vote for you? Um, I, I have to go back to my experiences. When I decided to represent myself, um, they told me that I was a fool. Uh, you know, and that you know what they're saying is a, uh, a person that has a client, uh, whatever the hell that is, he's a, has a fool for an attorney. A person that represents himself has a fool for an attorney. Mm -hmm. We're we seeing that right now in that guy, uh, yeah, Ronnie yeah. O'Neill. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's and, and, and look, there's a reason why they're saying that. that, that you know, That's not something that really should happen. Uh, uh, anyone caught in the system really, really needs a lawyer and should have a, an attorney. But, but that doesn't work the same across the board. The other thing they said to me when I said I was going to get a police officer to confess, they thought I was losing my mind, you know, that I was being delusional. But I made both of those things happen. This is the mayor's race, and, and I haven't I haven't won everything that I've tried. I've I've been I've probably lost more times than I've won. Um, but when I win, it it makes up for all the times that I've lost. I've been on and off the horse many 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 times. Uh, and so for those people uh, that are saying that, and if these are voters that are saying that, um, it's not me that's going to lose. It's going to be them. Wow. You know, if 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 they don't if they don't vote for me uh, in this election. I won't be the one taking a loss. My life, God has set my life. My life has been set. And so if I'm not the mayor of New York City, I'm one of the most sought after attorneys in the country. You know, this is this is not this is a sacrifice for me because that's what I've been doing for the last 30 years. God delivered me, you know, out of a life sentence plus 70 years, and I've decided to dedicate myself to fighting back, to fighting for people who can't fight for themselves. And so I made the decision that I wanted to make these sacrifices for the people of New York City. If they choose to vote for someone else, it's going to be them that's going to take the loss. Wow. My last question is, with this ranked choice void voting, who would be your numbers two and three? <laughs> you know, who else do you like? You have to like some me, of the let other me, candidates. Let me let me let me, let me let me let me say it like this, right? And and um, I'm going to say this, and and I'm going to say this in a way that I'm I'm a little there's some disappointment, uh, uh, in what I'm going to say, but I sat down with Ray McGuire twice, all right? Uh, I, I was reached out by a couple of, a number of camps, and I decided I wasn't gonna sit down with any of them, so I'm not gonna mention them because I didn't sit down with them, but I did sit down. He reached out to me and I sat down with Ray McGuire twice. Uh, and the reason why I sat down with Ray McGuire as opposed to the other candidates, because Ray McGuire is two things. Number one, Ray McGuire was not a career politician. Mm -hmm. I mean, he, he came from a background which was a corporate background uh, that in, in certain degrees, in certain respects, is, is out of touch with the average uh, New Yorker, especially in finance. Mm -hmm. uh, Ray is a, is a wealthy man. Uh, he does not live like the average New Yorker. Uh, but Bloomberg was much more wealthier than Ray, That's and right. he did a pretty good job. That's right. All right, and so I decided that I was going to sit down with Ray. 
because I believed when it came down to one and two that if I was to have anyone be my number two guy, uh, it would be Ray McGuire. And I would choose uh, Ray McGuire over any other candidates, uh, especially, especially Eric Adams. I, I think anybody uh, that's voting for Eric Adams, and this is a bold statement by another candidate talking about uh, a different candidate. But I have to be honest uh, about the fear that I have. The moment that Eric Adams, I had some issues with Eric Adams, not really major, but some, until he actually agreed with the stop and frisk policy. And once, you know, he got, went live and he said that he was going to continue that policy, I knew that he was a dangerous person for New York City. Anybody that votes uh, for Eric Adams is going to get what they what they deserve. I spoke to him. He said that he never said that he was uh, bring back stop and frisk. It, it's on TV. And he said he, he said he fought <laughs> against it. I, I actually have it on my social media. So I posted it. He said it. He is he is for what he actually said is that he's not only for the stop and frisk. He says that there's nothing wrong with the policy. The thing that he's going to do is he's going to make sure that he that the policy is not abused, which is an impossibility because he's not going to be out on the street. But believe me, he said it. It's on my post. If you want to look on my Instagram, Isaac Wright Jr. at Isaac Wright Jr. is my Instagram. You go on my Instagram and you'll see him being questioned about it and you'll see his answer on TV. So if he told I mean, you he didn't say that, he's lying. Yeah, I Googled it just now. I mean, even as way back as last February, uh, CBS New York. The headline is Brooklyn Borough President Eric Adams calls stop and frisk policy a great tool. So that goes to show you his honesty and his integrity. He said it, and he said it recently. In Spectrum News NY1, uh, May 24th of 2021, the headline is Eric Adams explains why he supports stop and frisk when it's used Absolutely. legally. There's no such thing as stop and frisk being used legally. Yeah, that's the whole point. Like, <laughs> it's not like... Ugh. Take it from an attorney. Uh, yeah, there's no yeah, such yeah, thing yeah. as stop and frisk being used legally. And and last week, June or June second, Eric Adams says critics of his record on stop and frisk can just shut up. There you go. Yikes. Now you have it. Critics of his record. His record on stop and frisk can shut up. Yikes. Mm -hmm. What's your what, what's your website, uh, Mr. Wright? Uh www .isaac Right. I'm sorry. www.rightfornyc2021.com. All right. The election is uh, Tuesday, but er, I it's think Tuesday. early voting is already early, started. Early right? voting has started, yeah. so they can get out and vote. And if you haven't registered, go register. Um, it's the the deadline. Actually, you should register today if you haven't registered yet, because uh, Tuesday you only, it, it takes a day for it to get into the system. So if you haven't registered, go register today. Uh, early voting is from now until Monday, and the uh, primaries is the 22nd. So the 22nd is your last day to do the right thing. Make the right choice. Vote Isaac Wright Jr. for New York City's next mayor. Absolutely. It's Isaac Wright Jr. It's The Breakfast Club.